Some call him a high-end hoarder, others call him a mad scientist. But today, we're gonna tour the 450-gallon aquarium of Chummingham's Reef. Let's go. What's up, coral people? If you're new here, my name is Remy, and this is the Bahama Lama Coral YouTube channel. If you are ready to fall in love with an amazing reef tank, please, do these three things. Please like, subscribe, and hit that bell notification so you know whenever I upload new videos, which by the way, should be more frequent this year. I don't know why I said it like that. Last week, I got a chance to tour the farm of Eye Candy Corals in Wisconsin. If you missed that, make sure to swing back to the channel after this and check that one out. This week, we head to Chicago to visit a good friend of mine, Mr. Ryan Cunningham. Or should I say doctor? He's a resident. I mean, you're a doctor at that point, right? I don't know. For the OG Bahama Lama Coral viewers back in 2020, I did frag a baby Scully and that was because of Ryan. Fragging Scullies is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the less commonly fragged corals in the hobby. We'll just say that and uh, you get a chance to see some of those frags coming up in this video. We talk about his setup, the corals in his tank, his filtration, and of course, the topic of the hour, pH. I don't wanna waste a second more on the front here. Let's go ahead and check out his beautiful setup. We're at Chumming Ham's Reef with the man, Ryan himself. What's up, man? Hey guys, how you doing? Hey, before we start, you got a, you got a hole in your wall. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be the new tank right here. It's gonna, I got a trash bag up because it's protecting the dust and all the construction work going on the other side. But this is gonna be a drop off tank filled with Acan Thophilia, Wesophilia, um, Cinerinas, and Scolemias, pretty much anything that my copper band is uh, picking. <laughs> so, yeah, everything's going in there. They're all quarantined back here in this little area um, right now. So, yeah. So you just moved. You just moved into this home, and you saw this room, and you're like, I know it would fit great a 450 gallon tank. Yes, I <laughs> immediately thought that because actually, when I was looking for a home, I was just like, I need a, I need one with uh, a room on the first floor, so that I can like, you know, isolate my craziness all into like this one area, and then you know, as we just were talking about, it's now spilling out into the main area now as well but yeah i really wanted to just kind of separate this out because at my old place i had like six different tanks all plumbed together and there there was pipes everywhere and extension cords and it was just a big mess so my dream was to just kind of have it all isolated in one room so take us through the system as far as like an equipment standpoint sure. goes and then and then we'll kind of get into all of these high-end little cherries you got in here sure so we'll start with the tank first this tank was made by crystal dynamic aquariums uh in california uh they're an awesome company uh, i really recommend them they're super busy or whatever but uh this tank measures eight feet long by four feet uh wide by i think this is 20 inches tall here um, and then the stand itself is a steel stand that I have wrapped in this PVC stuff that I bought from Home Depot. Uh, and that uh, is two feet tall. So actually fitting it through this doorway here at this angle to not hit this little corner right here uh, was actually really difficult. Uh, we thought we were gonna have to sawzall the door, but we didn't have to, but that was like a whole different uh, story. Um, so that's the tank. It's low iron, it's Euro braced uh, on the top and then in the bottom. And then something else that I really love about CDA is that they have these like triangular pieces of glass that they like put inside of the corners and then they silicone those in too. So I really love that because it's built like a, like a, like a brick house. So um, after that, I guess we'd start with my sump here. Uh, it's a little dirty as sumps tend to be, but uh, this is um, a Bashi Signature Series Custom Sump. Um, it's pretty much the same as the 48 inch uh, series that they have um, that Steve makes. Again, really great craftsmanship that he uh, has with this sump. He's a great guy too. I love Steve. Um, this is uh, the only thing different um, from uh, this one to their other 48 signature series is that this one's two feet wide because I wanted to fit my Nios 300, uh, 300 skimmer inside of it and it doesn't fit in the other one. 
Uh, I have two return pumps running on them. Uh, this is the Abyss A400. Um, and then down there is the only supplementation that I have in regards to calcium and alkalinity is uh, the, um, the Avis Marine K2 Calcster. Um, and that's how I supply all of my calcium and alkalinity needs in this tank. I do have an Apex dose that is hooked up to alkalinity and calcium in the event that I need it, but I haven't had to push that button yet. And then this product here is my UV sterilizer. It's 255 watts running series here. So this is a made by American Aquarium Products. Again, Carl uh, that owns American Aquarium Products. He is uh, a really great um, person to talk to about UV sterilization. Um, so this is actually a pond UV sterilizer that works really great. Uh, I have lights here. Uh, they're all Orphic brand. Um, and they're, they're doing a pretty good job uh, of growing the corals. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think we are really impressed by, aside from all of these, uh, was the fact that you can keep your pH up so high. I yeah. mean, how, do you, how are you achieving that? And yeah, let's... so right now, this is the beginning of the day here. Uh, I start at noon. I think it's like, it's like two now or three or something. So this is my pH currently, 8.56. So I start at 8.5 in the beginning of the day, and then I bounce up to 8.7, then back down to 8.5. So the way that I do that uh, is through mainly two mechanisms. Uh, one is through the calc stir. So that's gonna be giving you your biggest pH boost. And if you don't know already, calc washer has a, a number of different added benefits, not just in regards to um, boosting your pH and adding alkalinity and calcium, but actually it's a detox detoxifier. It, it will actually sequester um, different toxins out of uh, the water column and drop them out of the water column so they're not harassing your corals. Um, that was written by Randy Farley on the inter internet, kind of like the only uh, like regular forum that I'll check in on is, is, is the stuff that he's putting out. Um, so there's that and then I dose it at certain times during the day to kind of like step up my pH um, like at night when the tank is off and the pH is dropping I try to add in a calc washer at the night time um, and that's not going to change because honestly at the end of the day um, it's really not when you're adding calcium hydroxide which is what this what calc washer is because um, calc washer is actually only calcium plus a base um, so when you're adding calcium hydroxide into the tank, you're only actually adding calcium so that if you're thinking, oh, I shouldn't like, you know, uh, add calcium like, uh, or calcium hydro or calc washer, uh, all at one time, like at nighttime, because it's going to spike my alk. Well, that's not true. Um, because actually the calcium and the, the hydroxide actually, there's a chemical reaction going inside of the tank where the alkalinity is actually being uh, like made up inside of the tank through a certain chemical reaction. On top of that, I also recirculate my skimmer air um, through this jumbo reactor. So like I have, this has been talked about a bunch on bulk resupply recently. A lot of people are doing it now. Um, and actually uh, Ryan from bulk resupply just uh, started doing something that I thought I had came up with a couple of years ago is like, because I've been doing this for at least two years now, um, recirculating the skimmer air through CO2 absorbent media in order to conserve money. And, and, and honestly, it's really not about the money. It's, it's about like having to change this every three days. And then, and then if you realize that pH and alkalinity are actually tied together, I'm going to steal these guys here. This is Spanky. This is my um, youngest French Bulldog. I have three. I have an extra canister on here, um, which I call the uh, humidification or water trap chamber, which will catch all the humidity that's coming from the, the, the skimmer so it doesn't end up filling up my reactor here. This will run until I hit 8.8. .8 pH is actually probably the most important number in the hobby. Um, we all try to uh, focus on nutrients and calcium and magnesium and, and most importantly alkalinity. Um, but honestly, you're chasing the wrong numbers because if you can stabilize your pH, then you can stabilize alkalinity. I have the Trident over here, which is, which is what does all of my testing for me. Um, I don't do any like hand tests. I will test for phosphate every once in a while. 
um, which is also off the charts. It's greater than 0.6 right now. I don't know. Like, oh my what, gosh. I don't know like what it <laughs> is. Actually, it's, I have the HANA and that's the highest it goes up to. It goes up to two parts per billion. You, you will look at your Trident and you'll know that the Trident uh, alkalinity will actually go up and down depending on what time of day it is. It's also on like a sinusoidal rhythm going up and down. I started overlapping my pH graph and I was like, huh, maybe something that this Chris Meckley thing that he's talking about is like, right, like he's, he's actually, th these two things are connected. I don't know who's driving who, but there's one, someone in the driver's seat and I don't know who it is. Um, so I started trying to stabilize my pH by mixing all the different photo period waters into one sump. And I was actually able to squish that pH sinusoid down to like only a 0.05 swing. Like today I have a 0.20 swing. Um, so 8.5 to 8.7. Before I was doing 8.85 to 8.90. So there was like a really little swing. So then um, before then, like you have your trident, uh, so it would, it would do tests like let's say 8.31. So it would be 8.31, you know, in the beginning of the day without any of the stuff that I was doing. And then it'll be 8.46 later and then 8.52 and then like 8.3 like and then like 8.1 and then back to whatever. Um, when I started smushing that sinusoid and getting my pH more stable, um, I was like seeing like 8.47, 8.47, 8.47, 8.47, like 8.39, like 8.47, which was like really crazy because it was like chilling um, because it was at that moment in time that I started seeing my corals like really, really, like they're healthy now, but like I was like seeing like polyp extension, like and we all get off at polyp extension, like let's be honest, like this is what we, <laughs> so like uh, I was really starting to see like really increased health, really increased growth rates, um, all with stable pH. And so if you have been in the hobby and all the stuff that I'm like saying right now isn't like mumbo jumbo to your ears, um, I've discovered that in my most recent years of being in this hobby that it's actually uh, pH is the most important number. I know that as far as for my experimentation that I've gone up to 8.9 with, with actually, you know, increased benefits that I noticed like in regards to growth because um, the, the, the thing that we're trying to do, let's not forget what the goal of this hobby is, is to try to take a piece of calcium and two uh, carbonate atoms and put them together. Um, and that's what the coral is doing at like a cellular level. Um, and when you have acidic water, uh, anything below 7.8, that chemical organic process cannot take place. Um, because basically there's too many hydrogen ions present in the system and they like get in the way of that like combination from happening. I, well, I think out of, out of all of the explanations of pH that I've ever heard in this hobby, I feel like that's the best one that I've ever heard. You know, if we're going to be chasing numbers, we should be thinking about having that higher pH and making sure that that is a stable number because that kind of lends to the stability of all the other elements in your tank. So Right. It's, it's, it's really based off of like, you know, what is driving the system? If you're chasing alkalinity or you're chasing calcium, well, they're just passengers along for the ride, if I can use that metaphor. The driver of the system, the one who's in control, is actually pH. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, I guess real quick, you did mention that phosphates were 0. 0.6. Do yeah, you, know, so, you even know what nitrates are? Yeah, so I know, so I had a mathematician from Harvard, uh, shout out to Jack, um, take my water and do some dilutional studies. So I do know what they are, I just can't measure them here. Right now, uh, when he did those, I think that my nitrates were 70 and my, my phosphate was 0. 0.7. So this kind of goes back to something that Ryan touched on in this video that no one talks about, but I think is very important, is basically not really important about like what your number is, it's really important about what the ratio is. Uh, and again, I could talk about real world uh, findings like in regards to Lake Okeechobee and the phosphate treatment center there and red tide and all of that, and what happens when the red field ratio gets inverted. But um, the red field ratio is basically just nitrates to phosphates. So if you have a uh, phosphate of 0.1, which is what a lot of people shoot for, um, because it's not really close to the razor's edge, uh, then you should have nitrates of 10. If it's 0.2, it's nitrates of 20. 
um, so on and so forth all the way up. Um, but it doesn't really matter like what the exact number is, it matters that it's correct in relation to the other one. Um, so if you're having problems with cyano, dinos, uh, other different types of slimy algaes and bacterial overgrowth, um, then your red field ratio is most likely inverted, which means that you have too much phosphate to nitrate. And then to help with that, a good old UV sterilizer, which is actually programmed to the correct flow rates, um, is always beneficial to dampen down those bacterial populations. Well, take me around the tank. Let's see all this, uh, all this great stuff. So you got going. yeah, so this is. Uh, like my SPS area here, <laughs> like everywhere. I love SPS. My favorite type of coral is actually Acanthophilia. I love to watch them eat. Um, I love anemones too. I have a Colorado there and a Chicago sunburst right there. Um, so I have my SPS up top. They're actually receiving about 800 par. Um, if you believe that or not, that's what they're getting. I have a lot of different lightings going on that all kind of combine to create that high par level, but also not safe if you don't have a lot of nutrients. You have to have high nutrients and high flow if you want to have high par values like that, because if you have high par values like that, your corals are creating something called free oxygen radicals, and if you don't blow them away, and if you don't have fat, juicy corals to kind of protect them from that oxidative uh, reduction reaction that takes place when you have oxygen radicals like present, um, then your corals will die. So, uh, I have my SPS here. I have my big clam from Gary. This clam is actually 30 years old. I've had it for three years, but Gary grew it up from a little tyke. Um, then I have up here different acanthastria, but what they're called micromusa now. I have uh, over there one of my favorites, acanthastria pachyseptia. That's from my boy Brian. I have my torches over here. I like to keep all my similar stuff next to similar stuff. So um, that is how I like can you know optimize my space because I don't believe this, but I'm out of space again. Hence, hence the new build, <laughs> evolving into my kitchen space. Then I have all of I have a lot of different types of uh, you know frog spawns and octo spawns. Like I know that's not the correct terminology, but those are all down there. I have a bunch of different types of that. I have a bunch of hammers over here. And then I have all my holy grail, like esque type of torches up here. I have four different kinds of those. They're all a little different, but. Um, and then my Goni collections all up front. And then all of these are kind of running different par values. Um, right here, these three lights are, the, are turned up the most. And then I have like my Amazona 960 and 80s all kind of running like a little bit lower of a program up front because gonies like really low light and they like a lot of nutrition. Um, and then over here, this is something that not a lot of people do. I don't know if anyone does it, honestly. I posted this a, a little bit ago on Bulk Resupply, uh, Ask BRS TV. This is uh, called an endophilia. I think it's since been reclassified, but basically a close relative to the Cinerina. Um, so this is a fragged um, endophilia. Never cut it more than once, let it heal for a good amount of time, and then once you get to the F3 generation, so this is F2, I've made up this classification just for my own purposes, but like F1 is like, like one to two, and then F2 is two to four, and then F3 is four to eight. So this is all one and will be turned into eight. Once you get down to like the, the four to eight, that's when you see them round out really quick. Um, here's another one um, that I've uh, been practicing with. I've uh, been fragging uh, acanthophilia. So I'll take these out here. So these two, this one's been getting burned in the sun, so don't judge me. And I just took it out, so it's all scrunched up. But this one and this one are the same. Again, the same principle applies to those. Um, and then I've been fragging trachophilia, wellsophilia. I think that they took away the trachophilia classification. Um, I think everything's just a wellsophilia right now, but like in old school terms, these would be called trachophilia. This one and this one are the same. This one was the first one I did it on, but my uh, torch actually burnt the other half that uh, did survive, but uh, uh, I threw it out. It was practice. So like nobody is fragging 
tracheas or endophilia or I mean honestly when you're when you're talking about getting an acanthophilia you're probably spending a decent amount of money on it so do you want to cut it you know but it is possible you're yeah saying. well I think that uh, at the end of the day uh, no matter what happens in regards to the future of humanity <laughs> um, one way or another uh, the markets to ship us corals are going to shut down. So I'm just trying to get ahead of the um, the game here. There are some people that are um, actually, you know, s reproducing these corals sexually, um, but that takes a whole nother different realm of uh, expertise and like gamete production and, and messing with like lunar cycles and blacking out the whole room and having like no light in the room at certain times to actually get that to happen. And I just don't have the patience for that. I'd rather just cut them. Uh, and then this is another one right here, one that I've been doing for much longer. It's species is Scolemia australis. So this one, um, again, once you get from four to eight, that's when they kind of round out a lot quicker. And I can show you some finished ones down here. Uh, just let me put this guy back. Yeah, for anybody that's uh, for anybody that's on this channel and has been on this channel for a while, I actually, with your advice, cut a frag that I bought from you. Yeah, that's yeah, right. He's still, he's actually, still, uh, it was from this lineage right yeah, here. It looks like it. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is uh, one that's finished. Like so, like I said, when they say get down to like the eighth um, one or whatever, when you make one to eight or four to eight. That's when they start to round out really quick. And so I got a master here. This one's really cool. Here's my my my, my scullies that I don't want to cut because I just like them too much. That's the end goal right there. I really love this one right here. I got that one from Frost. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he's really beautiful. I wouldn't mess around with that guy. Maybe if I was in a pinch, I'd I'd cut him, but he's just so beautiful. Yeah. I gotta. Well, there's there's some theory that you have that if they get to a certain size, like yeah. that big, would be very difficult for yeah. Tap so survivors. that is my theory. Um, kind of like uh, I could hearken it back to just regular medicine um, in general. Like if a six year old breaks his leg um, and goes to the emergency room, he's going to be up and walking again um, within you know uh, six weeks with a perfectly brand new leg. Um, if a 80 year old breaks his leg, that could take him or her out uh, for yeah. good yeah. Uh, because sometimes they just they just don't heal as well. Uh, there's something that has to do with like the actual on the genetic level um, with age in regards to cellular repair and cell death and all of that stuff. Um, so in my opinion, it's the smaller scullies which heal faster. So whenever I'm at a swap, I'm always looking because it's kind of hard to tell like how big is a scully like online or whatever. Yeah. So like um, uh, I always try to buy them at the swaps, and I just look for the smallest ones, and those those tend to round out a bunch quicker for me. Ryan, I really appreciate you taking us through your tank and all your stuff. Like you said, we could probably be here for another three or four hours just talking about it because yeah. there's just so much to learn in this hobby, and there's always something to grab onto and I, I think that's what draws us all in right yeah that's definitely what drew me in and um this the never-ending experience to learn um and just you know have a piece of the this serenity like that you know that the ocean is that offers to i feel like all of us is uh this can be a very frustrating room but um when things are going good like there's nothing like that's better so yeah yeah, just very happy to, to have this uh, hobby in my life and uh, keeps me occupied. So. so do you sell any of this stuff? Can people purchase from you? Or? Oh yeah, yeah, I do, uh, I do sell online. Um, something that I offer, which not a lot of other people offers, is a two week guarantee on all my corals. Uh, so none of this uh, DOA thing and people fighting back and forth. Oh, you know, it died within an hour. Like, is that DOA, is that not DOA? If FedEx or UPS loses it, I cover it. If uh, the coral dies in your tank, um, then I cover it if it's died within a two-week period of uh, receiving the corals. Wow, I that is unheard of. <laughs> yeah. And where can they find you? They can find me on my Facebook page, uh, Chumminghams Reef, or they can find me on Instagram if you want to follow me on Instagram. I do, I do most of my posting on Instagram, which is connected to my 
a business page on Facebook. So both of those places, I'm the same across all social medias. I have a YouTube channel, which I really need to post some more, but honestly, like, Remy knows, I mean, this is like not an easy thing to do with the editing and the f and, and all of this stuff to get it really good, like how he does it all professional and all of that stuff is really hard. So uh, I've kind of slacked off on my YouTube channel, but every once in a while I will frag some ridiculous thing and post it on YouTube just so yeah. people can watch that process. Yeah, so you can follow me on any of the social medias, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, I'm available on all three of those, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, man. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, right off the bat, what was your favorite coral of that entire tour? Or your favorite piece of equipment or the number one thing that you learned? Just leave that in the comment section below. Ryan, man, that dude is a wealth of knowledge, and that's what I love most about him. This hobby isn't just about gear or flashy coral. It's being able to learn something new on a daily basis. If you think that there's a point in this hobby when you've got it all figured out, you are sorely mistaken. So strap in and enjoy the journey because that's the fun part. Remember that when you're battling green hair algae or Valonia. It's all part of the journey and that's, it's fun. It's fun stuff. <laughs> you can find Ryan on Instagram and on Facebook. I've linked both of those in the description below. He does ship corals across the country and I'm sure he'd love to chat, so hit him up. Once again, I gotta thank my buddy Tyler Inland Reef for tagging along on the trip with me. He is responsible for all of the macro shots, so if it's like a super tight shot, that is his expertise. And I wanna say, just real quick, when I saw this in the footage, like I didn't look at each one of these files as they were coming in, but when I saw this one, wow, that is just a beautiful shot. I almost wanna get that framed and put it on a wall because it's so good. What could be the perfect description for a shot like that? What could it be? What could it be? Maybe um, Scott Crow? Toasty! Nailed it. Nailed it. Hey, before I get out of here today, make sure to do me a favor and like, subscribe, and hit that bell notification so you know whenever I upload new videos. I should be at Aquashella Orlando this year. It's the first major convention of the year. Hope to see you there. Tickets are on sale now. Oh, hey, one last thing before you go. Ryan ended up finishing that drop-off tank with Canthophilia and all of his micromusas and everything, and it looks amazing. That Scully, he showed us in the video of the tank tour. Oh my gosh, this thing is awesome. Now we just gotta go back and take a tour of this one. Our Christmas decorations are still up. I should probably take those down, but I just I can't find the motivation to take those down. So they might be up until April. You just never know. All right, uh, that's gonna be it for me. Maybe after editing this video, I'll go do that. Or maybe I'll just fall asleep on the couch and take a nap or something. I don't know. You don't need to be here for this conversation. It's just kind of like a, a conversation I'm having with myself, but out loud. So uh, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one. Okay? All right.